I'll get the recording started here. So we're all coming from different places at this point in our day, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are back here. I'm feeling much better. Um, thank you for your concern about COVID. I was lucky to have just a few days of feeling really sick and a terrible sore throat, and then day eight now, just you might hear a little bit of shortness of breath, but a little bit of a cough here and there, but it's not, not bad. So I'm very grateful for that and grateful everyone's back here and able to be flexible, start our week two a little bit late. So I'm gonna give you a chance for the next few minutes to go inside and to, you can close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. You can shut off your camera if that's helpful for you to feel more space without being watched. And for the next few moments, I'm gonna guide you in a short meditation and simply get yourself comfortable or make movements that feel right to you. Letting go of any parts of you that tune into others or take care of others. Um, it would be normal to have parts of you that are activated by being on camera and tuning in to be seen and making adjustments to make others comfortable. So just let go of the, that monitoring. And begin to notice which parts of you are active here, what agendas inside of your mental activity are getting your attention. What things feel like they need your attention and one by one, I'm gonna invite you to notice and greet those parts of you. Simply pay attention to it, say hello to it internally. Like, oh, it's a part of me that noticed that I was uncomfortable with the temperature in the room. And I made an adjustment. So now I can let that part go and simply notice the next part of you like a conveyor belt and greet the next mental activity, thought, feeling, physical sensation the same way. Hold it in your attention for a moment. Maybe you listen to it or act on it if it's appropriate or let it know that you got the message that it's delivering to you and then simply ask it to step aside. And continue doing that with all parts of you. You may have six or seven or 10 different ones. Some of them you can't tell that they were there until you met the first few, the, the loudest voices and acknowledge them and had them take a seat behind you. But take your time and listen to even the quiet parts of you, quieter, more subtle. Maybe just feelings in your body that don't have words or beliefs. They're not well formed, they're just sensations. Say hello to those aspects of you and your body. Welcome them. And it can help to take slower and deeper breaths as you feel your feet on the ground or feel a solid connection to the chair and the floor that you're being held in. Just an effortlessness of your breath, letting your breath breathe you.
letting the chair hold you, letting gravity push gently up against you. And there's no judgment for whatever you encounter. You may encounter something that's hot or heavy or hard, stubborn, painful. You simply greet it maybe with new eyes as if it's the first time you're seeing it from this angle. You're slowing down to connect with it, to hold it without any anxiety or fear. You're settling more and more deeply into yourself, your higher self, the self that is not distinguished by any one particular part of you, the whole you. And Joe and Liz, I'm seeing your message. I don't see any other people telling me they can't hear me, so it may be your computer volume. Um, but then again, they can't hear me say that. I apologize. And if you have a thought that interrupts, like my voice, jumping tracks to attend to something that interrupts. We have no choice, we go with it for a moment. Suddenly you have a memory that you forgot to change the laundry again. And you let your body respond to that and you witness it come over you, you witness the thoughts that want to respond and fix it. You notice the feelings beneath those actions. And instead of letting that part of you take over and drive, you might hold on tight and allow it to pass. Let it know you'll change the laundry later. Come back to your, <coughs> your breathing, excuse me, your heart. Keith, we can't hear you. I wonder if it's just my connection or your mic. All right. I think it's just you, Joe. So letting yourself take a couple of clearing breaths here, letting go of anything you don't need, breathing out really slow, no rush. Taking in a breath, slowly taking it into the count of five or six and then letting that breath out to the count of six or eight. And once again, breathing in slowly, slowly as six seconds to finish that breath in. And really slowly letting your breath come out. There's no rush, eight seconds. And allow yourself to bring your attention back to the room. 
with appreciation for all that you noticed inside of you. Maybe a little bit more space between you and others, a little more openness and calm between all of the activity inside of you and the activity outside and around you. And when you're ready to join me again, just turn your cameras back on so I can see everybody here. Okay, welcome. So I'd like to just open up briefly uh, just to hear from people about your level of engagement with meditation so far in the course. You've been assigned uh, the curriculum up to and including lessons three and four. And a reminder, of course, that we're just doing two lessons each week, as opposed to what the curriculum tells you to do, which is get them done in 21 days. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're up to three and four this week. And then between this class and next, you'll be doing lessons five and six. And you don't do them every day. You can do those two lessons over the course of the next seven days. So some of you may have already gotten through each of those. So I'd be curious to hear what your, what the effects are. Maybe to begin to let people um, share a little bit about how, what impact this, these exercises are having. The exercise of doing a 10 minute, 20 minute meditation, um, learning a little bit about the nervous system. We talked last time about the window of tolerance. I told, I told the story of being triggered and being hijacked by my fight response in the restaurant when I was having a good time having spaghetti and meatballs and being uh, taken over by fear that there's some predator that was going to be harming our little girl, our, our daughter. And how I was regulated, my wife helped me get a hold of myself by simply kind of speaking to me and we talked to each other and we co-regulated each other from that stressful moment. And I was able to experience more openness towards this person who I really had no idea what their story was. I was just making up assumptions. And so, um, but at this point, you'll, you've had some time to look at the curriculum and see that the, the theme that is uh, very consistent is that you're, you're being asked to look at just your parts, yourself, your inner system of thoughts and beliefs and to not buy in <clears throat> immediately to everything that's going on, but to witness it in a meditative way without trying to change it, without judgment, witness what it is and see if it can maybe yield a little bit and allow you to show up more fully and have a more flexible set of responses to a particular moment. So I'm curious how that's helpful, where you're getting stuck, some people may be skeptical about meditation. That is welcome. I'm eager to hear what level uh, you're engaging with. Well, I'll jump in since nobody else is ready to. Yeah, hey, Joe. Um, I've never done meditation before until this past week when I practiced some um, uh, some of the homework and then the meditation just now with you. So it's it's brand new to me. I, I can see that it 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 could be it could be good. I, I've liked it so far, but it's it's so so brand new. Um, I have to really try to get the clutter out of my my mind of all my to-do list and and just uh concentrate on truly uh relaxing and, and listening to what the, the the meditation session is focused on but so so far so good les and i both are enjoying it we've done just a little bit of it before like in during some yoga classes online but so far so good cool thanks joe How many people can relate to having clutter? 
<laughs> up here, right? Sometimes we call that monkey mind or a mind that is jumping from one thing to another. Um, that's our shared experience. I'm, I'm finding it very nice to be involved in a meditation, this being my form of meditation practice right now. And uh, I've done various bits of meditation in the past, so it's not real foreign to me, but I haven't been practicing recently. So this is sort of my, uh, my, my practice right now. And I'm, I'm, the goals of it, I'm finding very helpful to separate um, my anxiety level that I, that I have in, in relationships and communication. And uh, um, I don't know, just feeling that it can tamp down my uh, high degree of energy and make me feel uh, much more comfortable with myself and being able to spend uh, moments away from if there were going to be a, a tricky situation to be able to spend some some time uh, away from away from that and to call a time out and to try and understand what's going on and I can really see a lot of my own um, degree of of, uh, of anxiety being a very major problem for myself to uh, learn how to settle down. Yeah, great. Remind me of your first name. I'm, I'm Hank, and we don't know how to put you on, put my name on the screen yet. We'll okay. try to figure it out before next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. That's, 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 yeah. Otherwise known as partner to Judas. <laughs> okay, thanks, Hank. Go to the three dots, if you, yeah. if you put your cursor on the, the photo. Um, Go to the three dots and the. Um, and go to rename. Meeting settings. Okay. All right. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. Uh, I was, was going to comment that uh, my past experience of meditation has been that um, I spent the whole time uh, thinking about whatever things were going on. And I've been surprised this time that it's been relatively little of that, um, including the, the one that we just did. Um, and uh, I don't think I suddenly become the most wonderful meditator in the world, but um, it's, it's an interesting um, new thing for me. So I'm uh, gonna, gonna see where this goes. Great, thanks Jay. I think for me, um, it's given me more empathy, not only for my partner, but for myself too. I think in the past, I've been so like identified with the way that I feel like I'm so triggered, I'm so annoyed. Um, but this meditation, at least this type of meditation, because I've done different types of meditation before, but um, is kind of creating like that separation in that space uh, and being able to yeah, be like the observer of that part of me versus being identified with that's who I am. Um, so that's been really big. And I'm Bryn, by the way, um, me and my partner, Brandon, were on the last call. We're in Arizona. So it's a little bit early for us. Brandon is just finishing up a work call, but he'll be on here soon. But we watched the replay. So nice to meet all you guys. Thank you, Bryn. Yeah. Nice to have you. Thank you. Yeah, and you're, you're speaking to, Bryn, you're speaking to a, a concept we're going to talk more about <clears throat> tonight, which is unblending. Unblending or separating from the part of us that is in the driver's seat at that moment. And our brain has this fascinating ability to, um, depending on the level of stress and threat that it feels, that the brainstem feels, which is very primitive, by the way kind of like dogs and cats and horses, same exact apparatus there that senses threat. And then it's like a little gate inside at the brainstem level between the brainstem and the midbrain, the limbic system. And if it is tweaked or triggered, as you said, Bryn, the typical thing we say to triggered, um, it starts to limit 
information, which is the you know, flow of electricity information, it literally limits, we can see this on a brain scan, it just kind of dims the lights to the rest of the brain, which is our higher um, functioning brain, which is actually rather fragile. Um, and very, and, and it's the caboose on the train. This is the last part of the brain that can be supplied with oxygen. Um, and it's only open and activated when the rest of the brain feels like, eh, you know, everything's safe here. Um, and I can slow down enough to take risks and wonder and think and feel. So, you know, we don't have direct control over that brain stem, the amygdala, but we have indirect control over it. And it just so happens that being an observer is something that humans are very capable of doing. We're very social <clears throat> um, creatures. And so we can often use that uh, bit of imagination with ourselves to imagine that this is some actor, um, this part of us is some being or person. And all of a sudden now we have an, an, an observer and the observed. We have a social uh, apparatus kicking in, which is, which is a higher brain function. And it's part of the limbic system. I'm, I'm sorry, the parasympathetic system, which is relaxing. So being social, it's, hard, it's impossible for the brain to be really social and engaged socially, which is, you know, I understand where you're coming from, or I can try to imagine that you're, you're different than I am. And I'm okay with that. If we can do that to ourselves, we may be completely irate and furious and lost our mind about towards somebody else and be in a state of rigidity or you know, panic or collapse towards them. But if we can begin to be open towards our panic, for example, see that as a part of us that needs our attention socially, internally, um, or open and engaged and conversant internally with the part of us that's collapsed and shut down. And we begin to observe that collapse, talk to it come alongside it, listen to it. Uh, it's kind of a little trick, but it's it's a very fancy, it's almost like magic. It begins to uh, take us out of that threat posture and open up that higher sense of safety. Even though, you know, the threat maybe hasn't gone away, but we're now thinking with our whole brain, which is usually a good thing for dealing with threats. Sorry, I just had to go off on that riff, but that um, I didn't want to, I don't want to interrupt. But is there anyone else who's having reactions and finding something that's maybe confusing or um, what kind of impact is this having on you so far? Uh, this is Judith. Um, I, I uh, wasn't so much aware of my, my, the hub or myself, but the way I sort of visualized it was in uh, in a supportive posture where I was just feeling like my body was being held up. And then when my mind was taken away on thoughts, I could sort of notice my posture would collapse. So I kind of envisioned it that way. And um, I, I'm very much, uh, my meditation is a lot about noticing my body. Um, and at one point I was sort of, uh, feeling pain in my heart and my throat. And um, I really liked your suggestion that we have compassion towards those places. And I, I was able to hold those with a tender, loving feeling and it was very transformative for me. Mm. Um, so that was helpful, thank you. Great, great. I also really like it that you say that 90% of the relationship has to do with us and that way, we have some efficacy because it's us that we're dealing with. That's right. That's right. I mean, our partner may may turn the ignition on the launch pad for some fireworks to go off for us. They say something that just cuts us because they're close to us and they know us and they can cut across us intentionally or unintentionally. But 
wh where is the, the rocket located? <laughs> this nervous system right here. This is the rocket that goes off or shuts down, you know, whatever your mode is, you may kind of explode outward with energy and fight, or you may collapse inwardly in, into sort of numbness and um, suppression of emotions, avoidance. But that engine is here, and that's where we're gonna focus. Is there one more person that might wanna share before I introduce a few more concepts tonight and then uh, do a little bit of, I'd like to do tonight some some live kind of demo work of inviting you to speak more than one person. So it's not just one person on the spot, but maybe invite you to think of something that a sequence of behaviors, and I'll, I'll be the first to tell about my own, uh, in which you get, you kind of lose your, your mind <laughs> with your partner. You lose your, your right frame of reference and you become rigid or selfish or closed-minded or hurtful. Because in this class, all of those things that we do when we get um, protective, th those are welcome. We're not going to be talking about stopping those things. The goal, of course, is to be able to not have to use so much protection with our partner. But we don't do that by um, disallowing those parts of us. In fact, we, we wanna pay more attention to those protective parts. So those are welcome here. And I wanna just create a atmosphere where you're gonna hear from multiple people about what their protector looks like, what it says and does and how it does something hurtful. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'll work with you a little bit on helping you unblend from it. Um, so I'd like to do a little bit of that work tonight, but is there one more person that might wanna share? Or any questions so far? Uh, Charlotte or Dave has their hand up. Um, yeah. So that was the first time I've tried meditating in a long time, and uh, I was trying. I was trying to follow your instructions, and I was looking for parts and on uh, the conveyor belt, and I was a little concerned that only one part came up. Um, which was um, sort of a work, a work part. I just came from work and I had a lot of things I was juggling and um, it seemed to, it seemed to work for me to just kind of acknowledge the part and, and think about um, soothing the part in, in, in some way. Um, but I found, I found the, uh, the meditation, um, uh, really nice, really, uh, peaceful. So thank you. Great. You're welcome. Thanks for sharing that. Open my window back up because I think the dog has stopped barking. We'll see. That's, that's really true. <laughs> um, okay. I, I want to share my my slideshow here for a second and get just cover a little bit of ground talking about parts, talking about the difference between our protective parts and our core spiritual self. I'm going to use the word spiritual here. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think I speak both science and spirit, if that makes sense to folks. I, I really am not religious. And that's not, this course is not about religious stuff. Um, but I really do find that there's this more and more um, further out we get into science and it's more theoretical stuff. The closer it starts to look like some of the things that have been ancient traditions, which include openness to not knowing and curiosity, deep sense of curiosity. Uh, let me get my screen shared. So the sim very simple definition just to review that that mindfulness is waking up from life on automatic and being sensitive to novelty in our daily 
experiences. That's it. There's a lot of um, mindfulness teaching out there that has some dogma attached to it, maybe from their um, from that particular religious um, tradition. But the scientific version, going back to John Cabot, Zinn, and some others in this country, who are in fact Buddhists, but really saw it the importance of 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 bringing a non-religious language to what they thought was a very compelling scientific result that they were seeing. They thought it was important to do that. So this is one of the definitions, waking, just waking up from life on automatic. And you've heard people use the term stop and smell the roses. I think that's, that's really what this is about. It turns out that doing so, slowing down and becoming more sensitive using our senses, um, and we're going to touch on that in a, in a moment, has, a, has a, a healing quality to it, similar to and probably uh, as beneficial from a health perspective as getting sleep, for example. That if there are moments during our day when we are not just a human doing, but that we have some being, meaning that we are, we are in receptive mode, you know, our hand, you look at your hand for a moment, right? Most of the time you're using it to type and each can do so much. We can pluck five different guitar strings in different orders and patterns. We can do so much manipulating with our hands. And on the other hand, it's, it's just, it's like an antenna. It, it has one of the most innervated and sensitive um, inputs in our body to be able to feel thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of combinations of texture, temperature. All of that is a re quality of receptivity, sensitivity. It has nothing to do with doing something. So, you know, literally like chewing your food for a, 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 a measure longer than you normally do allows this apparatus here that is designed to smell and to taste and you begin to enjoy or discern what's actually happening it just it just happens or the, the brain likes to see see what's going on it likes to tell you what it's noticing so but if we're in a rush all of that gets shut down <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me parts of us are different than our core self. I'm going to use the word self here to describe our our core sense in meditation. Um, sometimes that's referred to as big mind or meta. Um, has nothing to do with Mark Zuckerberg. So parts are, in fact, the way we exist in the world. You know, they are the container that we 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 get stuff done with. They are. Um, our humanness, if you will, and our, our self is actually, you can think of it not self as in self versus, you know, versus um, others. It's not that use of the term self. Self is more of a, using it to connotate something that's more like a higher spiritual awareness, a sense of high possibility and high potential. Um, and what we found out over um, some practice, especially working with trauma, people who have been severely traumatized taught us this first. And we didn't, for decades and decades, we didn't listen to them. Uh, we diagnosed them with multiple personality disorder and um, said that we can't do anything to help them. And then one day somebody started listening and saying, well, wait a minute, what if all of these parts are actually normal? And it's what happens when there's a lot of fear that's been injected into somebody's nervous system. And what if the brain actually fragments and becomes multiple as a way to protect itself? And so sure enough, as we start talking to these parts or voices, if you will, and we, instead of um, harassing them and medicating them, trying to get them to go away instead if we say well maybe this is normal turns out they settle down they become less extreme 
And they often will tell you about why they're doing or making you think the way they think they want you to do something. Even if they're very extreme and damaging, they'll say they think they have to make you um, set fire to that barn because, uh, you know, if you don't, yeah, you know, your life is over. You've got no hope. So this is the only way to, to, to feel better at this moment. Um, terrible example. I don't think anybody's really at risk of setting fires, but uh, drinking um, a lot at night might be the, the equivalent, right? Once we, instead of just getting rid of those parts of us and saying, okay, that's, a, that's an addicted part of you. It's dangerous. You should get rid of it. If we stop to ask it why it feels like it has to get you drunk on the weekends, it will, it will actually tell you the story of, of what it's afraid of if it didn't do that. And then you can actually work with it and try to help it relieve it of that burden of doing that thing. So everybody has multiple parts. These parts protect us like this fortress here. They, they remove us from connection because connection has gotten painful. So they come in and, and take us out of connection with others and ourselves, by the way, they numb us, <clears throat> but they can, they can think that doing more of that protection is the only way to go. So they can get rather compulsive in that regard. You know, it was, it was the right thing to do. You got burned when you, when you went too close to that fire. So you should never be around fire anymore. Well, that's kind of an extreme belief. You kind of shut yourself out of any, you know, useful relationship with something that, you know, could be dangerous, but may not be. So, and parts create what we call exiles. And in this course, I don't teach a lot of this language. I'm kind of giving this uh, to you here in the slides. It's not so much in the curriculum, but these exiles are what in the curriculum I refer to and will use interchangeably with the term um, primary emotions or vulnerability. So exiles are our vulnerability. <clears throat> exiles get locked into that castle, into that fortress. And no one's getting in there, never again, not after what happened, not after what you did. And so um, it solves a problem. These parts of us will protect us by putting away our vulnerability because it was, it's, it's painful. It's loneliness, it's terror, it's fear, well, it's often shame and fear. Those are the two boils down to shame and fear. And, it, and they have this ability to make sure we don't feel those feelings again. The problem is it actually cuts off our, our energy for life mm -hmm. in general, so it can make us depressed. Um, the good news is that everyone has this undamaged self. It's not something, unlike many of the other mythologies in our um, and you know, anthology of religions, if you go down the list, usually there's some sort of original sin. Um, and what we found just from a scientific, this is really not a spiritual statement, just from a scientific perspective, a neuroplasticity statement is true that <clears throat> unless you're literally missing, like you've had a, a hole in your head somehow, you're missing some part of your brain. And even then it's actually quite compelling to see that the brain tends to figure out how to fix that. If you, if you ask it to, um, every, the brain really is quite plastic and, and is undamaged. Again, if it's given the chance to heal itself and balance itself, the brain just wants to balance. And more than anything, uh, as a person myself who has struggled with depression, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned about the brain and why depression gets created is the brain is this piece of meat that its main job at, you know, through evolution is to conserve energy. It's got about 40 or 60 watts available, a little light bulb, this amount of energy. And it can't waste any of that energy in the course of the day. So everything that's happening inside of you, even if it seems like it's um, stuck or conf you're confused, you know, there's something, you're, the brain is trying to, to take care of you at all times. And so that's a, a nice segue into saying that, you know, whatever's happening, we can just show up there. Our attitude can be one of respect, first of all, even if there's some extreme thing happening in, inside of us, <clears throat> we can respect it because it's probably happening. It is happening for a reason. 
and we can extend curiosity to that to begin to under understand and witness well what is going on what's the reason why what, how did it how did it get stuck that way uh, when, when did it when did you first get this mission in life that you had to clean the house before you you know the the house had to be spotless before you could do something pleasurable with your body you know, like where did that start right it had a beginning somewhere um, so it, when we investigate these things with curiosity it turns out we can find the story and often we can support that um, fear or shame and and heal and that in turn will build intimacy as we do that with our own parts often the parts that we don't like the most <clears throat> parts of us that get us into trouble or are are hard for us to control as we begin to build intimacy with those parts it's far far more easy to invite your partner to take care of you or do something kind to you when you are already doing that yourself um, the the opposite is what i usually see happen i want to talk about this next is that um the opposite is usually what happens is we will tell our partner that that they have to be the one to take care of these parts of us because we don't like them you know and i'm in a bad mood and you're making it worse <laughs> instead of i'm in a bad mood i don't like that i'm in a bad mood i'm going to try to sit with that for a moment and see if i can settle and get a little bit more open to this bad mood that i have and then i'm going to turn to you i may not be in a great mood but i'm at least going to turn to you in some with a little more pliability so you can begin to see that I've, I've begun to grapple with this state that I'm in. And it makes a world of a difference. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story about my wife. We've been married for 22, 23 years now. And um, we have these, well, let's see, which story do I want to tell? I'll tell you the part about her sneezing. So, um, you know, I, right, this, this course is about taking risks. So I'm going to be taking some risks. and and trusting that whatever story you're making up about me, you will hold on to that loosely and 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 uh, and, and <laughs> hear the whole story. So I um so my wife has this quality when she is um when she's full when she's eaten, she sneezes. But it's like <clears throat> it's like not one or two sneezes. It's like an indefinite amount of sneezing that will happen. And at first when I met her, it was really cute. <laughs> and so and so at, at times it doesn't always get to me i'm i'm being a little melodramatic but there are there are historical moments <clears throat> that she would point out in at which i've um acted like a real jerk about it because for whatever reason it's just you know i just like tell her to like stop sneezing and like can she just knock it off like what's wrong with her and so i express my frustration towards her right how many of you have been the recipient of that yeah you've done something uh, something startles you you're driving and and you you yell out and then your partner's yelling at you for yelling out it's i think a really common <laughs> common thing you can't help it you just yell out so often i'll yell. the the sneezing is is sometimes very intense and it surprises me and um, if if I slow it down, so I don't slow it down. First of all, what I what often I'll do is just immediately the part of me comes out that wants her to stop, and that's what our interaction is. And then we're going back and forth. It's it's not a great moment, right? And so if but if I slow that down and do something what I call the U-turn, which you're going to be introduced to, especially now in week um, four, week five going into the curriculum. Uh, lesson five, rather. The U-turn is, is going to be teaching you that no matter what your partner has done, objectively, they have done something that's made your life difficult. They've sneezed like 25 times in your face. <laughs> okay. It would seem that, you know, maybe she's got a problem, objectively. 
but we're not going to use that frame of reference. Instead, the U-turn says, actually, can you look at, can I look at what's going on for me? And what's going on for me in that moment, if I slow it down, is my body responds involuntarily. I'm, I'm actually a little bit startled and afraid. It takes me, even though it's been 23 years, I'm surprised every time it happens. And then this is what happens next. If I listen carefully and, and slow down and listen to myself, I'm upset with myself for being surprised. Keith, you know that she does this. This is no big deal. What's your problem? So I've got a critical voice, right? So the involuntary thing happens with her. Involuntary reaction, I'm surprised. And then another part comes in to try to sort of clamp down and it's very critical of me. What's your problem, man? She's just sneezing. <clears throat> so I ignore all of that and just become critical of her. And you can see how this really could disconnect us. So the U-turn is me being able to say, ah, okay, there's, there's an important player, there's an important part going on in that sequence for me. If we slow it down, you're, you're going to find <laughs> interesting sequences like this, that there's more than just the first thought and first feeling, feeling. there's multiple parts involved. And if I can say to myself, okay, that, that critical voice is also just trying to help me, right? Um, maybe it could back off a little bit. It doesn't have to be so hard on me because I am just surprised. Anybody might be surprised um, by a sneeze. <laughs> so if I can have a little compassion instead of that criticism, then all of a sudden I'm a little, I, I may not be happy that she's sneezing. That hasn't changed. But I'm no longer in attack mode. Does that make sense? So I can, I can come to her honestly and say, um, I'm going to step outside for a minute. I'll be, I'll be back in a moment and just do something very adult <laughs> to handle that situation. Take care of myself without putting, putting her down or, or without having to um, manage her in some way. So does that, does that make sense? Is that helpful? Okay. So what I'd like to do is, um, and by the way, tonight, um, What's you know coming ahead in the, in the second hour here is about thirty minutes. You you'll have about thirty minutes to do some discussion in smaller groups. So where there's just like groups of three couples or pe three three people. So there'll be a, a, a time where you'll be invited to go through a few questions. I emailed that to you. It's a handout called Who Am I in Conflict. And the handout, um, if you're able to pull that up later, I don't need you to do it now, but just a heads up, that will that will sort of guide that discussion. And I want to do a little bit of it now uh, as a demo kind of live to talk about, you know, how we might how you might apply this if you're willing to to trust me with this and take some risks with the trust the group here. And speak about yourself here. This is, you know, I'm going to give you a couple guidelines you know, not to speak about your partner and what they do. This is only about what you do. And don't expect your partner to reciprocate. So if you volunteer and speak and want to uh, talk through an example with me, um, don't expect your partner to have anything to say about it. They don't have to. This is about you. Um, I sent that handout right before class. So the question for you to ponder as you are getting ready to consider raising your hand and volunteering and saying, Keith, I would love for you to talk through with me what's going on and help me slow down that sequence, uh, do the U-turn. Um, yeah, thanks, Rob. So the question to think about is like, is there is there a moment like like I've talked about where you you, you know uh, maybe it might not be the most um, radioactive thing that just produces hatred and resentment for you? I would I would caution against um, voicing that in a in a group like this that that we're just we're getting to know each other, um, but it might be like on a scale of one to ten, it might be a three or a four, you know, and threes or fours usually are probably fives. <laughs> We tend to underestimate um, something that's it, you've gotten tangled up around the axle with it before. It's not going to end your marriage tonight if if it gets talked about, <clears throat> but it wouldn't hurt if you had 
some input about, you know, what's going on for you. So anyone brave enough to, I'd like a few people to do this and we'll just kind of do a few different demos. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. okay, Theo, you ready? Okay. Ready. Okay, great. And okay. and I'll just underscore and, and remind you, Theo, that you know this is not about uh, getting your partner to reciprocate. This is going to be the Theo show for a moment. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure, sure. Great. All right. So, what is your um, moment where you 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 aren't in your best mind? Um, okay, so it's, it's a fairly parallel example, I would say, to what you're describing. Um, if I'm driving and I am going to park the car on the street and I get too close to the curb, like if it becomes a possibility that I'm going to hit the curb with a tire, <laughs> Teresa has a pretty intense reaction to that. Um, and, and it's common. It's, it's something about the curb and the rims. I, I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter what it is. I think what matters, as you spoke to, is that that is the reaction. And yet I'm still surprised by the reaction yeah. of how intense her, her reaction is to the potential that the tire is going to hit the curb. And so then it just kind of rises, something rises up in me, uh, defensiveness or anger or something. Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that I know that this is just for whatever reason, something that is a sensitivity for her. And yeah. so I find that I really, struggle to um, remember, I suppose, until suddenly I'm very close to the curb or um, garner compassion. I mean, it, it does, I guess, to some extent, depend on my mood, how, what my capacity is to, first of all, be thoughtful about how I approach the curb. Second of all, be compassionate if I've approached the curb too quickly or, you know, whatever. It seems so inane and yet um, it's such a microcosm of like how to, as you said, start to unpack what yeah. that chain of events looks like. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a good one. So it's, um, tell me if I'm getting it right, that you have a part of you that reacts strongly, sometimes gets mad and angry that rises up in you. And um, then it sounds like that part is directed towards Teresa. Is that right? Would, does she see, get to see it? Or is this just all contained inside of you secretly? She gets to see it. I think sometimes, sometimes it spills into our interactions and sometimes it's more internal. At least that's my okay. record. I'm sure that she may have a different perspective. I don't know, but I'm trying to think about whether or not there's another part, because I think this might be true, that is critical of myself for not being a competent driver and then gets defensive. And that's kind of part of the lashing out. Yeah. Like somehow my competence is being questioned. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. That's saying a lot. So you have you, you some, some, uh, um, Already, you've you've kind of done a little bit of the, you know, you've made my job a little easier because you're you're able to detect that there's more than just one feeling um, at that moment, or or within very very lightning quick succession, there's a bunch of feelings, and you're at least talking about two of them. One is the defensiveness that has implications for maybe losing connection with her. And the other is more of an internal one that that you're you're just maybe beginning to get awareness of that may be self-critical, right? 
Um, but you said it's hard to hard to be more open or relaxed towards your driving um, at that moment. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So one question I might ask you is, um, you know, and, and you know, by the way, I I, I want to just say for for demonstration purposes here, you know, it would be a really interesting moment to simply take what you've already said, Theo, and kind of turn to your partner. We're not gonna do this right now, but this would be a, a great, this could be one of those moments where you've, you've spoken for a couple of different parts, not just the primary one that seems to be the problem. You've opened up a little, you've said, look, there's, there may be something else going on here. I'm not too happy with myself about this. Usually that's enough to begin um, settling the conversation it may not it's not going to fix it right away but the temperature all of a sudden starts to come down if you can speak for that second part i'm struggling with feeling good about myself at that moment because i i'm so reactive but that's a, such a huge um shift that often it can be an opening or an invitation for our partner to begin to shift. Now, sometimes they don't get it <laughs> and they don't see it as really this big shift. And then we're bent out of shape because they're not acknowledging, okay. you know, we're, we're being kind of thoughtful here in, that, in this conversation. So, that? right. So um, the, the, what I've learned is, is to inoculate for that condition. In, in other words, prepare for the, the moment that your partner doesn't see that you're starting to soften and that you're starting to become thoughtful and you know, think about what's going on for you. And so my question for you, Theo, would be, um, you know, what's, what's the concern if you were to be more open and more, you know, careful I don't know if I'm using the right word, but yeah, more, more, more caring towards this part of you that's hitting the curve, more open to it. it and it's a real question. Is there any risk or is, does that trigger any thoughts or concerns if you were to be somehow more aware of it and open to it as it's happening? Mm. Yeah, I think there's some vulnerability, I suppose. I mean, it depends on which part we're talking about but I think the part that's probably is intuitively the part that needs the most attention is the self-critical part because uh -huh. that seems to be the springboard for any discord that's going to come out of the situation yeah yeah great so yeah disclosure, I, I did start reading no bad parts and there's some exercises in there so I did do a little exercise this morning that was surprisingly vulnerable. And it seems to have kind of like, uh, kind of created a, uh, a bit of a, I don't know how to describe it, a, a, a vulnerability like throughout my day somehow, mm -hmm. weirdly. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm a tad bit familiar with like what digging into these parts may start to, on earth yeah it opens up it opens up more stuff about you and you know where, where we can you know pause this for now theo is you know the the um skill that i think you'll be building all of us will be building in this course is is a containment skill or a hold I, i'd prefer to call it a holding skill where you where you discover that there that there is this activity going on inside of you more than the initial thing and that you you hold that so in this case with in your case the critical self-critical voice you know we don't have to get rid of that self-critical voice maybe you have you you can get closer to it like you said throughout your day at other times um it's showing up when you're driving at this critical moment so what if you could explore or listen for that at other times during the day when there when there isn't this risk of your partner's nervous system reacting so that would be um 
probably what I would consider a good place to focus in meditation is, it sounds like you already are, so. Thank you, thank you. Can you remind us of the title he was reading? It's called No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz. Okay. It's his latest one, and I've heard, heard that the audio version of that has some really cool meditations that he does, um, which I think would be very compatible with this. Judith, could I ask that you mute? There's a little bit of reverb. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Would anyone else be willing to um, explore uh, for, for the for, for the sake of science here, you know what's going on in your system, and what protectors do you are you familiar with, um, Joe or Liz? Yeah, let me chime in. Um, Liz and I have a bad habit, and probably especially on my side, where we will holler holler at each other from across the room or from a different room, and one of us is moving from one room to the other, so we don't always hear each other. And um, for a long while, I, I always wanted to blame it on her and I'd get mad that she's trying to talk to me from too far away. But uh, I think thanks to this course, just in the last couple of weeks, I've realized that if she's talking to me, often I'm moving, I might be moving out of range from her while she's talking. So it's just as much my fault that we get out of range. So it's taught me that um, often, if, if we can't hear each other, it's, we, we we both need to just uh, open our eyes and see um, what what can we do to get to, to be more heard, um, speak up or get closer to each other. Um, sometimes it's silly. It's like little kids uh, talking to each other from, uh, from 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 such a distance that we can hardly tell what the other is asking. It'll be silly things like I'm um, going to the store. Do you need us to get milk or bread? And and uh, the other party only half hears. So. Um, with with this mindfulness lesson today and even uh, two weeks ago, it it started to remind me to uh, to to fix that simple problem and don't just let your emotions um, blame your your spouse for for not talking loud enough. And so it's already paying early dividends to uh, to fix a problem and just listen better and and walk closer to each other when there's some news that has to be shared. Yeah, great. That's a great example. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you're you're um, addressing the core need there, which is you you can't hear the other person, and so you get close. So you actually invest energy in in moving instead of expecting the other person to do that. Yes, something as simple. It took took this course to remind me of, of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. I love that. It reminds me, my brother was, um, when he was younger, had so many speeding tickets that he um, was remanded by the court to take some class, you know, yeah. about to figure out why he kept getting pulled over. And he said to me, Keith, you, you're not going to believe this. I figured out why I was speeding. I'm like, yeah, what was it? It's because I'm always late for something. <laughs> like, <laughs> that makes sense, right? But like he, he found it difficult to stop speeding until he could make the connection that he's under this pressure to get there because he's leaving too late. Every, everywhere he goes, he leaves too late. So he doesn't have to stop speeding. He has to stop leaving late. You know, it's, it's an upstream problem. Uh, Charlotte or Dave? Yeah, we're unmuted. Well, at the risk of talking too much, um, I we drove home from the mountains today, and and we were we were rushing. It was about a three hour drive, and and uh, and Charlotte had a physical therapy appointment that we were trying to make, and the original plan was to drop me off at at home, and then she would drive there. That means I would be able to start work earlier, but that didn't work out because we started late, and um so i had to drop her off but then that was kind of far from home uh too far to go there and pick her back up again um 
I thought about just staying there and, and, and working, but I didn't know how long she'd be. Um, she loves this muffin shop nearby. It's kind, it's kind of far and high maintenance, but the, the muffins that I've heard are, are uh, to die for. And, um, and she wanted them. She kind of left it open as to whether I needed to go over there and get them. So I decided to drive over there. And it did indicate it was going to be a while, like maybe 15 minutes to get over there, 15 minutes to get back, which in my mind is kind of a long way to go for a muffin. And, um, but the other choice was to sit there and work. And uh, I decided to go for the muffins. And as I was going, and it was taking a while, and it took quite a while, I, I could feel a part of me that was getting a little agitated. And this part would ordinarily want to help me blame Charlotte when I, I got back with her about how late it was I was getting to work. And, um, and then the other parts that that think that maybe I'm not doing enough at work or doing well enough. And they were, they were coming, uh, coming into the foreground. And, and um, something uh, partway through though, I found some sort of calm. There, maybe it was another part. Uh, maybe it was the centered self that tried to calm things down and just say, to itself, just, you know, just do this for Charlotte. Work is fine. Um, you can, you know, and just try to somehow instill a calm. I don't know how to say this in, in, in parts, parts language or, but, um, so that was about halfway through. And then I, I felt really calm about the whole thing for some reason. Um, and when I got back to pick her up, which was quite a while longer, uh, she was ready to go and it, it just never came up. It's just, um, you know, worked really well. And that's not the way things have gone in the past for sure. That's not the normal yeah. sequence for you. Great, great. I mean, it sounds like you're you you you've got it. I mean, you're. It's a great example of where there's a little bit more. You know, we say self coming in, but what that what does that mean, right? It's a little bit of lingo. There's you're giving yourself space to notice what you're noticing. You're giving yourself space to notice. I want to share. I want to share a slide because it's it's a really fun, and interesting fact. Um, let me see if I can find it right here. You know, they did this study a number of years ago when iPhones, smartphones, first came out. They were using it for all sorts of you know purposes, but for studying people's happiness and moods. And Matt Killingsworth, who's at Penn. Uh, University of Penn School of Business um, is still actually doing this research. Um, and it's one of the longest and most cited on happiness that they would send people a message with the cell phone, you know, what are you doing at this particular moment? And ask them, are you happy? And give them a scale and they would rate it, unhappy or unhappy. And then they would ask them this other question, are you paying full attention to what you're doing right now or are you distracted? Is your mind going to some place that other than where you are now? And so he said, people don't really like commuting. Like we hate commuting, right? But when, 
we are substantially happier when we're only focused on that commute than if your mind is going off to something else. And that is just such a, 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 a that can be earth shattering. Like that, that fact throughout our day, in fact, the more we, if you're in the shower, how many of you recognize that you're actually in the shower? Or is your mind already planning the day? Some of you are like, yeah, I love the shower. <laughs> um, but just let yourself be in the shower instead of planning and doing something else and, or be on your phone. The phone is one of these huge um, invasions of our nervous system, an extension of other, you know, the, the nervous system of the hive. Um, and we need boundaries with that sort of thing. All right, so who am I in conflict is where I'm gonna invite you to spend some time in the small groups talking. In the small groups, this is the first time you're doing it here. We're gonna have this feature in the rest of the groups from this point forward, the rest of the meetings. There'll be a time when you will get paired up with a few other couples or other people to, to get to know each other a little bit, um, but to share and keep the conversation focused on some of the questions here, and of course, just generally speaking about how you're interacting with the course, everyone's gonna have a little bit of something to offer. And so I'll invite you to try to stay focused and um, be good listeners to everyone uh, in the group and be mindful of um, you know, taking turns, obviously sharing. But um, if you didn't get this email, you can, in, this is in your email. So this, this, these questions are gonna go away when I send you into the groups. So this won't be on the screen. So if you can't pull it up on your email, then go ahead and take a picture of this um, with your phone so that you can see. Let me uh, get rid of that, there we go. Give you a second to take a picture. And I'd like you to just talk about this with each other. Um, don't out, you, don't, this is not about outing your partner. Hopefully everybody gets the vibe of this course by now. This is about you. Your partner is here uh, if they want to be. <laughs> this is not about you getting them to say something or um, that's going to come later. That is the icing on the cake, the interactive piece with your partner. So we're focusing on just, just you. And does anybody have questions about what you'll be talking about in the breakout rooms. Okay, great. I will um, pop in just to listen as a fly on the wall. Um, I'm not there to uh, necessarily help, but I, I'm curious and will help me hear what people are getting and what they're, what you know, what you're struggling with or what you're working with, so I can bring some of that back. Um, and, you know, whatever is shared in the group stays in the group. I think I've said that at, at the beginning, but, you know, this is, it's all meant for just the people here. So, okay, I will send you into groups for 30 minutes till 8.45 or till quarter till the hour. Okay, so there should be about three or four of you in each room. And like I said, I'll pop in with my camera off and muted just to listen and uh, I'll see you soon. Okay, the rooms are open. get the recording back. I was just so um, moved to hear everyone, your flow and, you know, working through the questions. So I really appreciate what I was, what I was, what little bits I was able to hear. I didn't get to hear everybody. And just the way you were holding space for everybody was amazing, right? And hopefully that, um, you know, people in the past in these groups when I've done this have 
commented that 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 the groups the group time as you get to know each other and hear about you're not the only person that does this and and you're not the only person that gets stuck and, and that sort of thing that becomes the the most valuable thing even though i'd like to think some of these ideas i have are are good some of them might be um, but it's really what you're bringing. So thank you. This is an amazing, amazing group. And if I split you up uh, without your partner, <laughs> sorry about that. Sometimes that can be helpful. Sometimes you might want to tell me you want to be in the same gr group. That's fine. <clears throat> so um, just a couple things to to everyone is. circle back on. Um, and if you're not, if uh, some of you need to mute yourself. The, you know, the simplicity of this, I think, is is amazing that when we're born, this is what unlocks our nervous system. This is what unlocks our immune system, in fact, through throughout our lifespan. Um, is somebody there? Is somebody paying attention? And if there isn't the nervous system and then the immune system, in fact, which is, you know, embedded in the nervous system. If nobody's there for us, in a sense, when we're terrified, when we're filled with shame and uh, feel like we, we don't have any value and worth to others, um, when, we're, when we feel like nobody wants to be around us and we're, and we're isolated, if there isn't a connection or somebody to notice us and say, hey, come on, come on back, you belong here, and the nervous system in a, in a real way does shut down. It says, well, what's the point? And so, so we have this pandemic of depression. Um, that I've been swept up in myself. And I, there's very few people I think who are not touched by it in some way. Um, but the simplicity of, and the beauty of this is that just by paying attention, it's not, we don't need complicated solutions. Sometimes we need complex solutions, but it starts with just a step. And so what I, what I loved about what I was hearing is the questions were designed to do this, um, to elicit this, you were, excuse me, you were speaking for the protectors and you were speaking for them, hopefully with some more attention. Even if you felt like it was difficult to speak about some of these things, there was a little bit more care, a little bit more holding of yourself with yourself. Um, and particularly, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the term amnesty to describe this course because it's, it's, it's amnesty for your your darkest and hardest and most entrenched stubborn protectors. Uh, we don't have to get rid of those parts of you. We don't have to get rid of the part of you that has disgust towards your partner. I can't tell you how many trainings I've done as a couples and marriage therapist over the years. The state of the art training for couples therapy is in all these manuals. It's, 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 over and over, you hear, you've got to stop, you've got to interrupt um, these protectors or else they're going to get divorced. This is the, the freight train, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you see contempt and eye rolling, you've got to intervene and stop that. My concern after being trained doing that has been, um, well, good luck because that, that horse is galloping in that direction for a reason. <laughs> and we can try to, stand up to it and it might be worth might be technically true that we ought to stop it but good luck trying to stop that horse because it's it's scared and it's it's running because it's afraid and if we can address what it's running from then we probably don't need to stand directly in front of it and and, and confront it and spend a lot of time in therapy confronting people and their narcissism or their selfishness so if you have a narcissistic part, we all do. If you have a grandiose part, we all do. Or a part that feels worthless, we all do. You know, we don't have to um, edit those parts of us out. We can hold them. We can hold them. We can take care of them. We can get to know them. And and um, the 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 course is going to be bringing you into self. These are the qualities of self. There's eight of them, which is convenient if you're writing a book about this um, compassion courage clarity calmness connectedness creativity confidence and curiosity and i've shortened this into cola the acronym that you hear in the meditations care openness love 
and attention. Um, but this is, you know, any one of these, they're all connected. They're all connected. Um, you know, so somebody cuts me off, some jerk cuts me off in traffic on the beltway and I'm sitting there seething and getting ready to hit the gas pedal on my BMW and get right up on his bumper and try to, you know, thinking about how to, how I could rearrange his personality because of how flawed it is. You know, I actually don't have to change that. I don't have to get rid of that, even if it's destructive, that impulse. But I could be a little more curious about that and maybe allow that part of me to do that in my head for a moment. And then I don't have to hit the gas pedal and I don't have to ride his bumper and get into a road rage. I can give that part some space internally so then it doesn't have to then act out in the world. So that's what the self is capable of doing when we let it have this imaginative, brilliant quality. And um, last, let's see, is there, is there one slide I wanted to give you? Sorry. You know, what does it look like? Um, because, you know, we're talking about the U-turn from this point forward in the course, it's going to be really, it's about practicing the U-turn, practicing the U-turn. Even when you think your partner has to do the U-turn, well, guess what? That's when you're going to do the U-turn. And trust me, I've been at these conferences where we're all trained how to do the U-turn. We know this stuff. And we get into some little tiff over somebody saying something that wasn't right. And then all the you know people, because we're humans, we start pointing fingers. You do the U-turn. No, you do it. <laughs> it's, it's not funny. It's actually, so I really want to underscore, you're going to be in that moment where you're just convinced that, damn it, your partner needs to do the U-turn and you're sick and tired. You've done, you've already done the U-turn today. That's, that's done. It's your part, your partner has to do the U-turn. And I'm telling you, no, that is not correct. You're going to do the U-turn and, and keep doing it and keep doing it like a hummingbird, just ho holding that, that posture, stability in flight. Until, and if maybe your partner doesn't do the U-turn, the end of the day is you're going to sleep great because you've done the U-turn and you've connected to something deeper for yourself. You feel a little bit better yourself. It's up to your partner whether they want to do it. And what does it look like after we've done the U-turn turn, when, when we have a little more self, a little more core, bigger self, we can, we can say something more courageous. We can say it to our partner, something like this. And we'll get into this at the end in the last few weeks, more and more about courageous conversations. But you, you've already begun to have them, by the way, by sharing, talking about your parts. That's courageous. You know, you can speak for your parts. I, I, I don't want to be this person that is um, just, just doing love with you. I have a part of me that's bartering. I, I barter. I negotiate. I'm sick of that. You can say that about your own parts. I'm sick of it. I'm in conflict with that part of me. I, I don't know how to do it. You might say that's speaking for vulnerability. I'm going to teach you that you can you, you can memorize this as a placeholder. You don't have to have your exiles healed and sorted out and um, in some great place. You can memorize this little mantra. You know, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm I do know I need you when I'm when I have no idea. I do know I want to be closer to you when I'm when I'm in this place of uncertainty and confusion or disorientation. I'd like to be closer to you. And I don't know how to do that, but I like that. <clears throat> and so will you join me? You know, and that's implicit in this. Will you will you join me? And then that's it. That's it. It's a question. It's a real question. Curiosity. Will you join me? Not I need you to join me or else. You know, that's what the protectors say. That's what the armies say. And then, of course, the other army has to come in and defend. So, you know, it's very, you know, this is the civilians here saying this. I don't you know. There's no missiles pointed at you. There's nothing to back this up. If it, if it goes wrong, I could completely fail at this. I hope it works. Are you, are you willing to, you know, think about what you said to me and maybe get back to me? It's okay if you don't. But it'd be great if you'd be willing to think about what you said and maybe we can talk later.
something like that. So that's called the return. We're doing the U-turn so that we can do a return. Those of you who have twinges of panic about the idea that your partner who may be an avoider is going to get entitled to do more avo avoiding through this meditation course because you are. You're, you're entitled to do that through for good purposes, but only if you're clear about coming back for the return. You're saying, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm not going anywhere and you'll be the first to know when I'm back. I'm just going to myself, I'm going to my heart. I'm trying to find myself, I'm trying to get right. And when I, when I start to find a, a fingernails worth of myself more, I'm, I'll come back to you. That's all, you don't have to make a big grand thing. Um, so any last questions before we stop here? Your, your assignment is to go into lessons five and six, keep doing those meditations, watch the video, do the written exercises, read the, read the book. And um, we'll come back and talk more. And it, the U-turn is something that takes people sometimes weeks and weeks and weeks and months. We're compressing this. So if it feels fast for some of you, just pick up what you can here. The goal is not to get it all right in seven weeks. It's just an introduction. So any questions about where we're ending here today? Great. Love to hear everyone. If you want to turn your mics on. This is Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being Thank here. You. Thank you, guys. Thank Enjoy. you. Thank you. Everyone's participation. Enjoy chatting with everybody. Yeah. Take care. It's a great group. Really love you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thumbs up. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you next time. Bye. Yeah, you're so good.